Hey, Tommy, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Um, we're uh, so yeah, this is new. Uh, you joined the book club pretty early, and it's just um, I thought I'd get somebody interesting from the community on every uh, couple of weeks to talk about it, and uh, I think you ticked loads of the boxes uh, for this this one. Mainly, not mainly one of the <laughs> one of the big ones being that you're in Seattle. Right. Yeah. No, I live in Seattle. I moved here uh, last year. Uh, and so I'm at Grand Zero for Amazon.com or whatever. Um, I might just give people a bit of a background on, on who you are and what, what you do. So like, wh- wh- where are you working sure. at the moment or what, what, what brings you? You're obviously Irish, but why are you in Seattle? Sure. Yeah. So I'm Irish originally, um, moved out here for college and then moved to Seattle. Um, uh, last year when I graduated to work for a nonprofit here, I work for Tor, um, which is this kind of privacy and security company. Uh, I work there as a writer. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and I'm living in Seattle these days. And so, you know, as you're walking down the street, it's like every second person, um, works for Amazon. And so it was really interesting to kind of like finally get around to reading the backstory of, you know, how this became this, you know, multi-billion dollar company that's kind of on the tip of everyone's tongue. Um, when, is, you know, your friend's boyfriend works for Amazon and, you know, your, your, your old babysitter who moved out to Seattle because Ireland is small, uh, you know, her husband works for Amazon and all this sort of thing. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to touch on Amazon in a second. So just more on, on yourself, just to kind of set the scene. Um, so Tor, oh, sure. Tor is obviously like, a, I think of it as a, as a private browser. I don't know. You, you called it a security company. Is that what's the... Yeah, I, I mean, we're a nonprofit, but so the, the kind of elevator pitch is that we make software, um, we make a web browser that's uh, more secure than kind of all the other web browsers. Um, and so that's super important for, for kind of consumers who want privacy, for, you know, activists in, you know, repressive regimes who want to, you know, you know blow the whistle on, on kind of human rights abuses, for journalists in countries where, you know, you can be kind of carted off by the authorities if you, if you say bad things about, about the, the government or the leaders. Um, and so there's kind of like a wide, a broad variety of stakeholders for whom kind of, uh, using the internet kind of in a private manner that can't be kind of surveilled or monitored or whatever is, is super important. And it's important for kind of consumers like you and me who just don't want their, you know, identity stolen or who don't want, you know, kind of all of their information to end up in like ad companies. And it's important for kind of journalists and activists and human rights workers, and lawyers and, and, and doctors or whatever, uh, as, as well. So I work there as a writer, um, basically talking about why these kind of issues are important. Cool. And then the other reasons I, I thought that you might be, so like we've got the Seattle, you're obviously into tech. I, I would know you since you're maybe, I think maybe like 12 or 13. I think I know you, you were about that. Uh, yeah, like really yeah. young. Um, two other kind of key things that I think make you super relevant for this is one, you're always, since I know you, you've always had your head in a book. Uh, so you're a big reader. <laughs> you're a huge reader. Uh, and then the other one is you would be kind of exposed to uh, sort of a lot of went when, what went on at Amazon in the early days because your brothers have a, a pretty successful startup in, in Stripe. So I think there's th- those are kind of the boxes that I think you tick for this. Like you, you've seen a lot of this stuff firsthand. Um, sure, sure, yeah. I, I guess, yeah, whatever benefits of growing up with, with a head in a book and, you know, brothers who were just always into computers. Uh, sure, I'm happy to bring whatever dubious expertise um, that and, brings along. So, like, that kind of, it's good to jump into the book then uh, on that topic is, like, do you think Amazon is, is a tech company or, like, because I think what I got from it is, like, they, they obviously wanted to be that and Jeff Buzz wanted to steer it that way, but uh, maybe they weren't at the start. They felt like more logistics and then they've kind of morphed into tech and, uh, so like, uh, what did you take from the book on that side of things? Like, were they, are they a tech company? Do you think? Yeah. So, so, so kind of two takeaways that I got from the book there is one, you know, ostensibly it's a tech company because it does all of these things on the internet, but really, yeah, when it started and when it, it's, it's really kind of core business, which was, which was books, um, really was just kind of, you know, that there's some quote from like the, the New Yorker or some profile somewhere that, that kind of stuck in my head where it's like Jeff Bezos stared into the internet and the future of e-commerce like stared back or something like that, where it's just like from a, from a logistical standpoint, um, the internet is just a really good way of getting books into people's hands. Um, and you know, the book talks about this a lot in terms of, you know, the books that, that, that kind of are, are very, either they're kind of out of print or just kind of not many people want them. And so, you know, when you're in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska, you know what I mean? You know, miles from any bookstore. Um, it's a really easy way of, of getting books like that. But then of course, you know, nowadays it's like they're a web hosting company. They've got Alexa, they've got, you know, 
all of these different, they've got like phones and tablets or whatever. They've got all these different things. And, you know, of course, like Jeff Bezos owns, you know, some significant percentage of the Washington Post. Um, and so it's like, you know, what sort of company is Amazon? Kind of who knows? It depends on, on kind of what you're, what you're focusing on. Um, but it's, it's funny mentioning kind of Jeff Bezos owning a bit of the Washington Post because that was the my big thing from the book, which was that Jeff Bezos did not sit down to be interviewed for this. Um, everyone kind of around him did, you know, all of, all of his little underlings or whatever, and, you know, some of his family and, and kind of a lot of people at Amazon, but but not Jeff himself. And so you get this amazing kind of like, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's kind of the authoritative history of Amazon, but kind of why Jeff Bezos did it or kind of what he's think, thinking of think next or how this of, fits into like Jeff Bezos' Bond villain master plan, like kind of who knows. Yeah, that's I, I, I get the sense that there's a big master plan in his head. And I think maybe not being interviewed is just maintaining that element of control. I think he seems to like control and like if he gave away the control of, of that, I think it would feel like a full story. I don't know if you've read um, Steve Jobs' is the big uh, biography of him by Walter Isaacson. Like, I have, but... Yeah, he gave, he gave a lot more access and in-depth interviews and he actually came across really badly uh, in the book. <laughs> I, you know, I thought, so I don't know, what, 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 how do you think Jeff Bezos came across? Like, do you think it was flattering or, or not so much? Like, he seems like a really hard taskmaster. I think he... He, he, he seemed... Yeah, I, I mean, I mean the, the kind of the Steve Jobs comparison is easy, but he really does kind of seem this demanding... Excuse me, he really does seem this kind of demanding... Um, kind of tech company boss, um, in the sense of, I think, you know, when you're, you know, uh, when you're managing kind of thousands of people and, and when, you know, kind of these problems in the distribution center threaten to like grind everything to a halt, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess that there's kind of arguments to be made on both sides where it's kind of like, yes, he's a very, very demanding boss, but he's got all these kind of like irons in the fire and he's kind of got this kind of grand vision and it's like, you know, kind of, why are you getting in my way yeah. sort of thing. I think it was interesting that time, like I, I, early days when he kind of started to step away a little bit and it, that seemed to last for like three or four months and then he, he just jumped back, like <laughs> he just had to, had to sort of jump back in. Um, he, yeah, so like, I don't know, like uh, maybe to his friends and family, he's probably a nice guy, but I don't know. He doesn't strike me as a hugely, uh, yeah, he seems, he seems pretty ruthless if you ask me. Like just the, the, like they've crushed a lot of businesses. Like how, how did you think of, yeah. what did you feel of, of that? Like, I mean, if you're looking at publishers and like, uh, is that just technology becoming better and uh, disruption or is it, is it like crushing businesses? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is. I think there's kind of two arguments to be made where it's like, on the one hand, um, book publishing has really been the same for the last like how many years, and they were kind of dragged kicking and screaming into into ebooks um, and audiobooks. Um, but but you know, book publishing has really been the same for the last kind of like you know 500 years. Um, and, and so on the one hand, I'm kind of very sympathetic to the idea that that you know. They should, you know, kind of change it up and try new things. Um, and on the other hand, yeah, I, th I think that, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the way that Amazon did it can be kind of seen as, as boisterous or kind of pushing too hard too quickly. I think that it's interesting, and I think this is true of kind of Steve Jobs as well, that if they had worked more on kind of ingratiating themselves into the kind of overall area like if, if Jeff Bezos had given himself a timeline of like a year to do it which is what he did, you know kind of if he did that in reality if he'd given himself like three years you know okay he would have lost profits or whatever but kind of would it have been so much better if he had just kind of like not been kind of full pedal to the floor and what's the what's the feeling like in in um Seattle like obviously like they must have brought so many jobs and wealth and prosperity like is it a, is it a like is he held up as a as a, an idol there or is it are they sort of frowned upon like what's the sentiment on the ground the, the sentiment on the ground is kind of uh as far as i can tell kind of a little bit um stranger on basis because he's such a low profile in seattle i mean everyone kind of talks about him in dc now but but kind of in seattle as far as i can tell at least um he really is not kind of known around the place you know in, in san francisco you know you'll 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 bump into startup founders all the time but, but in seattle you just, like don't see jeff bezos very often um and i mean so, so but kind of despite that every second person really does work for amazon yeah, here yeah. um and you know they're 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 moving kind of so so many um different industries in terms of kind of creating so many tertiary jobs um and i, I think that's kind of 
important to note as well when we're talking about you know Amazon net good and net bad in the sense that there are you know thousands of people who have this, who have jobs and who have good jobs um, who would not otherwise have. And so you know you can say that Amazon's not perfect; they should have done X rather than Y. Um, but kind of at the end of the day, it's it's a lot of new jobs. It's a lot of new jobs, not even just in Seattle. You know, there there are big distribution plants in Kentucky. I all, think all over or, the place. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Kentucky. There was yeah. certainly like the book is one thing I'll say. The book is about three years old, so I got the sense like they've even grown ridiculously since the book has been published. So it it, it does feel very out of date for yeah. a book that was published in like 2012 or 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just shows you how fast. But I think they grew like 30 percent last year, which is like insane for a big company like his net worth i was just reading that he's, he's at about 110 120 billion now and bill gates is at 80 or 90 so like he's, he's just shot past them one thing i, I really yeah. thought like showed his personality was the google deal so like he was an investor in google and mm -hmm. they were kind of like look we've got our investors we don't like but he just went back and just insisted that he he kind of became an angel investor so um i thought that kind of mm -hmm. showed his, his personality a lot how much do you use amazon uh, i think it's uh, it's much bigger in America than the rest of the world. Like it's so ingrained with Absolutely. Prime and uh, all, all their various, like, I don't know if you've got grocery shopping and things there. Like how much do you use it on a day-to-day -day basis? Kind of, I'm just looking around my apartment now and it's kind of embarrassing in that like my desk here is just like piled high with books. Prime, you know, now that you mention it, is terrible. Really? It's so easy to just, no, I'm sorry, oh, it's, it's terrible it's, it's in the sense of big. like, yeah. uh, do you know what I mean? It's so easy to buy. And and yeah, you know, kind of everything from kind of furniture, like books are the traditional one or whatever, and groceries now, but like furniture, um, I'm just literally looking around my apartment now, um, the, the sheets and the duvet on my bed. Really? Um, yeah, no, you really just can get everything on Amazon. Obviously, it's like not very, it's like, fine you know yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it'll do as, yeah. as far as quality goes you know i mean i'm a recovering college student and yeah, so yeah, yeah. uh yeah yeah you know but you know kind of like there's a there's a there's a, like, an, like a cheap armchair sort of sofa thing and that you, is in the corner of my use, apartment do you have an alexa somewhere there in the in the building the, no. the, 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 there's an alexa yes over in the corner um the the whole smart assistant thing is kind of dubious to me um where on the one hand i think it's handy but on the other hand, I don't think it's going to be this like paradigm yeah. shift or whatever. I think it's just like a, uh, an accelerated version of Siri. Like Siri was always kind of, okay, I can use that, but it's not like, it's, but I don't know, like anything I really like technology is weird. Like, so like it's same with like uh, VR and AI, like, the, you know, like they're, everybody's beating the drum about it, but it's, I don't think it's practical mm -hmm. enough yet, maybe. But like, so, so what you're saying is Amazon are basically all over your house. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of people for whom that's true in the sense that, you know, there's I have like friends or whatever, that there's always Amazon boxes, you know, from books or from groceries or things piling up. But the, the funny thing about Alexa, though, is that, is that all of these smart assistants, just before we move on, all of these smart assistants are so kind of intelligent in, in kind of very narrow fields. And then, you know, one of the problems I'm having right now with Alexa is I'll ask it for the temperature and it'll give me it in Fahrenheit. And I know, oh, and I just activated it. Oh, her, brilliant. Because, <laughs> whoops. But, but um, I'll ask her for the temperature and she'll give it to me in Fahrenheit. And I've been here five years and I still don't know yeah, Fahrenheit. Yeah, what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and, and the setting, I just, you know, can't find the setting or the setting doesn't work. Yeah. And so just like this, you know, core feature, which is you can just ask it for the weather. I'm just yeah. like, this is totally useless to me because it gives me this number like 60. And I'm like, what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Um, do you think, um, one, one question I kind of had was like, do you think, let's say uh, Bezos gets hit by one of his rockets or falls off uh, falls off, and has a terrible accident tomorrow and is no more. Where do you think Amazon goes then? Do you think like is, is the company big enough that it keeps driving on as it does or is it completely led by him? Like if you own stock in Amazon and Jeff was no longer there tomorrow, would you, would you keep that stock or would you get rid of it or like... I think hard about selling it because I think that, you know, as we've been talking, uh, Jeff Bezos is the visionary. He's the one who who went back and to Amazon or he went back to Google rather kind of again and again and again. He's the one who made this really long bet that in kind of 2006 that web hosting would be this big business and now it's this you know 10 billion dollar business whatever. So so I think if 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 Jeff, Jeff Bezos was hit by a bus tomorrow like knock on wood, um, Amazon itself as it is right now, it would be like a snapshot of Amazon right now in that, you know, it's delivery business, it's grocery business, Alexa, whatever. Um, 
but the kind of the next 10 yeah. years of things, you know, kind of what, what's coming, you know, will Amazon get into self-driving cars in some way? Jeff Bezos is, is doing this whole rocket ship thing. Yeah. And, you know, kind of, I, that really does seem like very separate to Amazon. But, yeah, well, you know I, what I, mean? I think from uh, the book, like, it seemed like he maybe, sp- I think he, maybe Wednesdays or something, I think he spends with the rockets and then like mm-hmm. another day he spends half a day at the Washington Post. So like he's, he's not hands-on, but uh, the vision... And the drive, I think, yeah, would I think Amazon would be absolutely fine. They're not going to, you know, like they exactly. wouldn't. But but yeah, they they maybe wouldn't drive on to that next that next level. Yeah, and it's it's a pity as well that the book ends in 2013 because you start to see this, like you said, this this kind of separation of Jeff Bezos from Amazon in terms of Blue Origin, in terms of the Washington Post, in terms of just general Jeff Bezos, who is always this very you know quiet. Um, in the shadows sort of person who didn't like the limelight um, is, is now stepping forward and kind of, you know, there's another New York times uh, profile that I was, that I was reading where it's like, and he, he can't afford obscurity anymore. Yeah. Like he, he just doesn't get to have that anymore. Even another um, a, a classic and, example of that, I think it was the Oscars a couple of weeks ago, or I saw it might've been the, like the golden globes. One of those, like one of the shows from Amazon. Yeah. Whatever the, what's the TV called? Amazon. It's prime as well. Is it? Or when you, yeah. Buy, yeah. Yeah. Um, prime TV. Yeah. One, one of those was uh, awarded like or, or up for, so he's that, he's that one of those. So like, that's a whole, di- like, I think they're putting 2 billion into content this year. So like, who's to say they couldn't mm-hmm. be uh, Hollywood esque in the future. So yeah, he's, he's, he's being oh, absolutely. forced to kind of come out to the fore, I think is what you're saying. Like in terms of, exactly. You can't, well, especially owning the, the Washington post, like you can't, you can't, own something of that power and not be uh, more prominent. Exactly, especially because he's getting into you know Twitter fights at dawn with with Trump, where um, they're accusing you know the, the Jeff Bezos Amazon post or whatever, um, and so he really is being kind of dragged kicking and screaming into the into the spotlight or whatever. Uh, what but I mean, you know, at the same time, sorry, go on. So no, I was just going to say, like, how does that make you feel as a journalist? Like, you've got the world, you know, one of the oldest newspapers in the world, one of the most possibly credible at the moment, along with the New York Times, mm-hmm. because of what's going on with fake news, all that. How do how do you feel about a billionaire owning that, or like the richest man in the world owning that? Is it like, is it going to be impartial? Do you think he's got good intentions? Is it something more sinister? Yeah. So, 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 so from a kind of macro American democracy um, point of view, I don't think it's kind of too worrying because, you know, if the Washington Post reports on the New York Times is, you know, kind of back, you know, um, um, kind of uh, under the hood of, of, the, of the, the New York Times and kind of, you know, what's going on in the, in the back room is what I'm going to say. And, you know, the, 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 the New York Times covers the Post, the Post covers the New York Times or whatever. From an American journalism standpoint, I don't think anything too nefarious can happen because all of these uh, newspapers are kind of providing checks on one another. Yeah. Um, you know, is the new, is Washington Post uh, able to uh, report on Jeff Bezos and Amazon with the same, to the same extent that they could before? Uh, I think that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, we're seeing this a lot in journalism where journalists were supposed to be this impartial, you know, you know, voiceless, you know, voice from God or whatever. Um, and, you know, kind of, you would ask, well, how do journalists get paid? And you're like, Shh, no, 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 we're just this impartial, like whatever, you know, don't talk about the money. We're just, you know, reporting the first draft of history or whatever. And I think that that kind of doesn't hold up, especially, um, nowadays with the election where kind of so many journalists just kind of, you know, are, are so anti-Trump because so Trump is so anti-press and it's like, well, you can't, you know, we're all humans here until the robots start writing the news, yeah. you know, we're going to have kind of opinions and, and the journalists are going to have to well, get paid somewhere. Just, uh, sorry to interrupt you there. It's actually, that was one of my next questions was there was a stage in Amazon's history when the homepage was really nice curated by journalists or, or sorry, mm-hmm. the book descriptions. And then like there was a, Part in the book where they phased those out and the algorithm yeah. algorithms became more successful than the journalists. So, like, why wouldn't that happen with the Washington Post? It, it very well might. I think that the, the as the I kind of periodically check on this every few years. Um, and the last time I checked, news stories, uh, sorry, sports stories written by robots, um, kind of. Uh, tests couldn't tell the difference between sports stories written by robots and sports stories written by humans. Because sports stories, I guess, as, as news stories go, are kind of predictable in that it's like Formula. the score was X yeah. and Y, you know, A and B team were playing. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, this is kind of starting, and I, I, I wouldn't want to bet against the robots anytime soon, as you know, whether that's in journalism or self driving cars or, you know, curating the Amazon homepage. But I think that, that people are kind of, um, 
Uh, people like to worry about this because it's like the stuff of a very science fiction thing. But I always remember one of the first books I ever read, which was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl, um, where, you know, his father works in a toothpaste factory and he works screwing on the, the, yeah, the yeah, caps yeah. of toothpaste. And then his job is replaced by a robot. Um, and he's like very sad. And then at the end of the book, he gets a job repairing the robot that like took his job. And I'm like, you know, yeah. machines have always taken our jobs, you know, that the, the street lamp, you know, put the put the lamplighter out of business. It, um, it does feel like so, there's an, a kind of an inflection point coming though, and Bezos is really at the center of that. Where you know the self driving cars, the delivery, the but, um, I, I guess yeah. That my worry would be like if if I said to you, if I said to you in the eighties that you know uh, robots would be writing websites and that, like you couldn't imagine it. If I told you now that mm -hmm. robots would be writing newspapers, sounds sounds pretty fanciful. But like. If, if somebody was going to do it, I think Bezos would have the, the ability yeah. to make I it. Mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you work a lot with content as well, and you 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 employ editorial teams. Yeah. Um, kind of what are what are your what, well, well are the you, biggest thing thoughts? the biggest thing like I think editorial is massively important, but the big it's the biggest cost in the business. Like, so to run a newspaper or a media organization or whatever it is is expensive. Like, you've got to hire people. So if if it comes to a day where where robots make that a tenth of the price and they're just as effective, like people will switch to robots. It's, it's, it's a scary world and I don't know what sort of it means for repercussions, but uh, yeah, I, I, I could absolutely like it's happening. Like you said, in this, I think that I saw that sports one. It was maybe like two years ago, was it? Or the, mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know what advances there's been in that, but I do know that some of the publishers have like really smart AI that like, translates posts into different uh, mm -hmm. publishing platforms and different languages. So it's, it's maybe already starting to happen. Um, how, how long did it take you to read the book? I'm just kind of interested. Is it like, was it a, a real page turner? Was it? It was, it was kind of, he, he, he did a good job of, of kind of making it kind of narratively gripping. I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, as kind of, it made Amazon almost into this living thing because he, he couldn't do Jeff Bezos. And so he kind of almost made Amazon into this living thing. And, you know, these things almost turned to derail us, but like Amazon came through. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought that was good. Um, I, I think just biographies and autobiographies are kind of very political things in terms of who you can talk to and who you can't. But I thought it was, I thought it was really good. And um, I read it in about two kind of four hours, just like nose and book, as you say. Yeah. And the, the personal element is quite, uh, uh, gripping as well in, in terms of like I, I don't think it's a coincidence that Steve Jobs and, and him are both uh, adopted um, like it, it obviously oh, it, it obviously gives that sort of drive or the, the, the element to prove themselves beyond normal uh, levels yeah 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 no I, I think that, that that's true and I think that a lot of people say that uh there's a great quote from from Warren Buffett where he was asked just like, what's the one sentence of your success? And he says, focus. And I think that kind of uh, all of those kind of cliches about hard work beating talent when kind of hard work shows up or whatever are, are, are totally true. And actually speaking of Warren Buffett and kind of the cool things that Jeff Bezos is disrupting, do you see this Berkshire Hathaway Chase Amazon healthcare? Yes, I did. Actually. Thing that's going on? Yeah, I, uh, only headlines. And it's a, there's that and there's also a bank uh stroke card I, I, like a check like a checking account like a normal account so the, yep. those are the two big things at the moment but like that's the crazy thing is like I, I think it was a tweet or i can't remember somebody really smart said it the other day and they were like okay well amazon is now you know like they're going after healthcare and and uh, mm -hmm. what, what's more about the berkshire hathaway one what what, what did you read about that yeah, well, so, so I think that the, the connection with Berkshire Hathaway seems to be just that these are kind of three very big, very successful companies um, who, who's, whose kind of leaders are, are kind of throwing their hands up in despair about the healthcare situation in the U.S., which is kind of as, as they should. Um, and so they're kind of, you know, like the, 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 the fable of the little, little red hen or whatever. I, I, I was more recently a child than, than you were, Niall. So yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm reverting back to all of my childhood kind yeah. of like whatever, but yeah, I'll do it myself to the little red hen. And so it's kind of like, rather than waiting for, for, for someone else to invent the future, they're, they're doing it. And it's this kind of crazy idea of what happens if just, we, we just give people healthcare. Why is this so difficult? Um, and it, it kind of, reflects a certain amount of, I don't want to say arrogance, but, you know, kind of the, the, the people who are crazy enough to think that they're going to invent the future usually do. I think it's a great case of that. Yeah. And do you think like, 
living in America, like on the outside, healthcare seems like a ridiculous problem for such a like successful company to or su- successful country to to have a problem like that. Even though, do you think it's going to take mm-hmm. somebody like Bezos or somebody like that to come along and fix that, or is that is it just too much to even ask of him? Uh, I I, th- I think he may have met his match in the kind of bureaucracy of Washington and the intransigence. Um, yeah, I mean, I you know I've been living here for five years, and I am still kind of scratching my head about how Washington kind of works and why why you know. And again, you know, kind of the the, the other big example of this is gun violence, where it's like the rest of the world kind of like scratches their head about why this is still somehow up for debate in America. Yeah, um, but it is. Um, do you think do you think Bezos has got like political leanings now? Like he's become the richest person in the world. His company's fantastically successful. Like you don't you don't buy a big newspaper like that and start hanging around Washington. Like what's what's the end game here? Right. Like is it to influence? Is it just simply to like early in the book where they had to avoid the sales tax in each state? Like they're obviously lobbying pretty heavily. And like is it just a lobbying at a higher level or is there something bigger going on there? Um, I think that'll depend on forces beyond just Bezos, um, in the sense that, you know, so we have a businessman with no political acumen, currently president, and is this an an anomaly where, you know, this kind of other politician comes back in 2020 and takes over, and this was just kind of this weird blip where, where, you know, the country just kind of acted out, um, or, you know, you know, people are talking about Oprah should run and it's like, oh, okay, if we're going to actually, you know, do this now. We're going to make this a thing um, where, where you know business people run for president. You know, you could do worse than Bezos. I think he's a very kind of intelligent, driven person um, who's who's made a lot of really smart smart bets. I mean, can you imagine? You know, with the with the Amazon Web Services thing, you know, he made this bet in like 2006, invested a ton of money into it, and now it's like one of the most profitable parts of Amazon. It's like, can you imagine what sort of bets he could take with like America? Um, and kind of what sort of things to come up with. It would be interesting and nothing else. And I think that he wouldn't, put it this way, he wouldn't screw up the country any more than it's currently, uh, yeah. on the, on than, the, than on its the, current trajectory. On the flip side of that, um, there are, like, I, I don't think it comes across massively in the book, but, like, I, I've read some of the, Guardian have done a couple of really good pieces investigating behind the scenes. Like, the, the warehouse conditions sound like yep. they're pretty... Um, pretty horrific at times. For uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'm guessing people in Seattle they might be in a slightly better level of jobs around there than the warehouses. But yeah, some of the conditions are pretty bad in the in uh, minimum wage stuff like that. But look, it's like everybody says. Like you, there's you've got a choice. You don't have to work there. But I mean, uh, uh, does, did that eat through at you in the book, or did you uh, did you just think that's uh, market economics? Uh, <clears throat> a little bit, and I think it's true, and I think that that, that Bezos did kind of acknowledge it, and, and kind of it got too painful for him to uh, to to ignore, and so I think he has put put kind of you know not to be a, an Amazon apologist all the time, even though they're furnishing my entire apartment. Um, it, but I'm also kind of conscious that when factories came in in the industrial revolution people flocked to them because it was such a better job than working out in the fields or you know it's backbreaking labor under the hot sun or whatever and so, so I, I think that people can be kind of almost kind of condescending when they talk down about um uh, certain jobs when it's like you know that the amazon shouldn't do x or y and it's like well you know what's the alternative i mean you know, okay, it's not as cushy as the office job, you know, running running Amazon sales. But, you know, it's, it's better than it used to be. And I think that kind of working conditions more generally, you look at kind of a global sense over time, is just like very much up and to the right. Um, and so, you know, is there room for improvement? Probably. Yeah. You know, is it better than it was? Also, yes, I think. And how do you, like, I'm kind of interested to see, like, how people feel like what do you feel about amazon as a company so like it's all across your apartment it's you you sleep in their bed sheets you read their books you you it's it touches every fabric of your life like piece of your life like do you know the way like some some brands like apple i still even though they make some mistakes and their cables fray and stuff like i still love apple it's a great brand you know i really like i have a connection there uh who else do i love like uh, you know like there's there's brands that make me feel different things like Red Bull. I'll see their content. I think it's really cool. But like, I don't know, is, is Amazon more functional or do you love Amazon or is it just like, what, like, what, what do you feel when you see that logo, if anything? That, that was exactly what I was going to say. And I was actually exactly going to compare it to Apple where Apple is this kind of 
kind of delightful company and you love using their products. Amazon, I think, is more utilitarian where, where it is just like, I need this book by tomorrow. There's only one place I'm going to go. Um, but it is kind of a very kind of functional relationship. I guess Google is, um, Google is very similar to that. Well, their search anyway, like it just gives you yeah. what you want yeah. without any bells and whistles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, having said that, you know, the, the big four tech companies, uh, as far as I can kind of tell, are, are Amazon, Apple, uh, Facebook and Google. Yeah. And of all of their long term prospects, if I was going to bet my house, it would definitely be on Amazon because they're kind of very they're just kind of head down, slowly taking over the world in a way that I don't think Apple is. Um, and in a way that I don't think I think Facebook and Google excuse me, are just going to continue to kind of flounder and make stupid mistakes. Yeah. So, so uh, um, like, I think that's interesting to say, I don't think a lot of people would agree, would have agreed with you in about 2012 or 2011. Like they've, they've sort of were around and then they've accelerated now into this place where they're just in a indomitable position. But like, that's, that's, and, re- and it's reasonable. snuck up on everyone. Yeah. That's, that's the crazy part. Um, in that, you know, with Apple, it was very flashy and you kind of released the iPhone and then it was like, off from there but amazon is just very you know and people would have laughed at them and you know books online what the hell and then yeah, yeah. The kindle came out and they made no profit and they're like who's running the business here there's no profit and then like I now that's everyone's one kind of like sitting a, up and taking notice having run a business myself i think that's one that i took like there was definitely a kind of a sneering laughing for the first 10 years of their business a lot of like ah, it's this little web startup like from the likes of barnes and noble and then even mm-hmm. walmart and like all these big competitors seem to quite dismiss them as like a little piece of shit on the bottom of their shoe to be and you know like it exactly. snuck up on them how big they became like i think i think maybe yeah. they thrived on that amazon being that underdog yeah yeah and i bet if we if we had jeff bezos here he'd be like yes it was it was that uh <laughs> it was that sort of attitude that made me like double my efforts it's one thing that i must go and do actually as part of like finishing this book is r- find some interviews with him because i don't get the sense like he doesn't come across my radar very much on like youtube interviews or yeah, I'll, I'll link you. Um, he was on 60 Minutes in 1999. Um, and right. it's funny for two different reasons. One is Amazon was just getting started at that point. And so it's like everyone is forced to take notice of them, but they don't uh, But they don't uh, really take them seriously or kind of see what's coming down the line. And then the second one is Jeff Bezos is just exactly the same. He's, he's kind of this weird, driven geek who has this vision, which is like exactly who he is in, in yeah. 2016. Yeah. Do you think uh, there's many similarities with him and Elon Musk, another sort of crazy entrepreneur, or is Elon Musk a bit flashier, or like they they certainly yeah. think at the same scale, I think. Exactly, yeah. and I think that these people, you know, Steve Jobs, um, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, just kind of think in different scales than the rest of us. Um, they really are kind of crazy enough to change the world. Um, so yeah, if they're all kind of in a class of their own and you can kind of delineate them, uh, kind of when you drill down further, you know, like Elon Musk is just kind of concerned about getting to space, whereas Jeff Bezos, the space company is to do with kind of general travel and just getting them up into orbit or whatever. Um, but if you're, you're splitting hairs about yeah. space travel, yeah. like literally space. Yeah. I don't, um, I don't get a sense. I don't like Musk loves the big press conference and like telling you what he's doing. I, I think. Bezos and the guys with their rockets might be doing way more stuff than we know about, and they're happy to keep it mm-hmm. under co- under co- wraps. Maybe I don't know. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting world, and like the, I, I find that clock quite interesting. I can't remember what it's called. The never the clock of the long now. Yeah, um, that's just that's just him in a nutshell. It's kind of, I, like I think he's just doing that to kind of keep beating that drum that it's it's a long game they're playing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know a little bit about Clock of the Long now. They're, oh, really? they're, they're funny people. They, they, they write the, the, the date as in the current, you know, the current year is 02018. Right. Like with the extra zero at the gotcha. front to like promote long term right, thinking. Right, I think right. it's so kind of like, I, I always, you know, when I read about them, I always feel bad. But I'm kind of like, well, today I have to, you know, go to work and do, you know, X, Y, Z spreadsheet and report and, you know, meeting. And yeah, it's like, yeah, you yeah. know, meanwhile, these people are like, so in 10,000 years, we're yeah. going to have this problem and this problem. So really, we should be thinking about, you know, yeah, doing that's this and great. that. And that's other. great if you've got 120 billion in the bank. But like if people, <laughs> gotta, if people have got to pay the bills and they're like, shit, it's like tomorrow's Friday and I've got no rent. <laughs> like it's, 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 it's a different right. world. 
Um, so generally, yeah. like, would you kind of wrapping it up? Would you you'd recommend the book to others? Uh, what would you like? Uh, like I said, you've been around startups. You've seen like from having one laptop to a big company. Like, what what would you? What parts would you take out of it if you were starting your own business tomorrow, or if you were running a big company? What, what like what what were the key key learnings for you? The the key learnings I think are it reinforces kind of what you're reading about focus and about really just kind of you know kind of working kind of long hours and there there kind of really is no substitute and but the other kind of things um, that I took away from it in that he left. A very comfortable job at uh, Wash in Fed or just Wall Street, yeah, like you know, fund. somewhere yeah, on yeah, Wall yeah. Street. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what I mean. I'm kind of Wall Street is kind of the quintessential kind of safe, well-paying job, and he just kind of, you know, and he 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 kind of left that with no uh, idea of what he was doing really. In that, I, I remember that the 60 Minutes interview was saying that he packed up his things and put them on a moving company, and he was like, "I'm moving out west. I don't know." where but just start driving west yeah and the moving company did and then three days later he's like all right i've decided on seattle and kind of you know what i mean really flying by the seat of his pants and i think, think that kind of speaks to this idea of life being kind of predicated on three or four different points when you have this really big decision in front of you and you if you make it and kind of take a really big risk it pays off but kind of it it must have been terrifying to, to and kind of imagine convincing you know your wife or your parents or your you know your family generally that you know you're leaving this this high paying job to go start this internet thing at a time when people really didn't um, didn't know about the internet and then and that kind of brings me to the third one where like I, was, I mentioned earlier the quote of you know Jeff Bezos looked to the internet and the future of e-commerce looked back at him where it's like you have to be really smart to kind of see that I think and to to kind of see a future. That's now, you know, kind of like I come home and there's like three Amazon packages of varying sizes, you know, kind of waiting for me yeah. um, by the door. And kind of like to look at the early days of the Internet when, you know, it's just a bunch of professors, you know, emailing each other about science things to, to go from there to everyone will have, you know, the small computer in the pocket and can order, you know, a book and it just gets there tomorrow. To it, seems, impressive, it seems really obvious it's... now. Like the, it seems like, of course, yeah. but like you, you had dial up desktop then with you know like modems yeah. and like it's 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 not a logical step at all like it's, it's yeah 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 for sure um what were your what were your big takeaways um i think just the relentless drive and um like just w- refusing to take no for an answer like they just just keep bashing the door down non-stop until like he's, he's definitely also a, a bit of a genius like he was clearly gifted as a child uh so I think it's the, I don't think just hard work is the answer. Like he's, he's, he's a genius and working extremely hard, uh, which is, yeah. which is what you'd, you'd see. But, um, yeah, I think they're, they're probably, I think they're still maybe a little underappreciated as a company of what they're, what they're doing. Like, I think a lot of people would still say, oh, it's just that book company or that delivery company. Like I, I, I the split of their revenues, the uh, Amazon cloud stuff is, I think it's nearly half their revenues these days. And then the, like, so yeah, I, I, they're a really hard. Co- I, I'd like to read more about them, about the last three. If I could get the same book uh, yeah. just about the last three or four years, I'd read it tomorrow. Cause I think there's, uh, they, they've really accelerated even since then, but it's, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, very good. So like you are literally following in, uh, uh, Bezos's steps by going out West to, uh, Seattle. What? What are you? How long are you going to stay there for? Or what's your? What's, what's the your, plan? Um, I, I, don't, I well, just to, to to that point, I mean, Go West has been the kind of quintessential American growth thing for kind of two hundred years. So I don't, I don't kind of flatter myself too much by saying that I kind of went from New York to Seattle. Yeah. Um, the the current plan really is is hopefully to stick around uh a tour of my current company for for a while and do cool things i think it's a really interesting time for internet security um because uh so, so there's a statistic that there were 50 million oh, sorry no sorry 12 mil, 12 million things connected to the internet in 2012 just like you know laptops computers phones yeah. whatever there were 12 there are 12 billion things connected to the internet. Yeah. And in 2020, that number will be 50. Wow. 
Um, so, you know, over four times, um, four times as many. And so, you know, and that's because, and that's just, you know, your laptop and your phone are one thing, whereas now it's your baby monitor, whereas now it's your car, whereas now it's your, uh, you know, locks at your house, it's your TV, it's your fridge. It's just kind of, we're going to be surrounded by so many more things that have an internet connection and, you know, kind of what does that mean? And kind of what are the, the, the potential downsides? What does it mean that you have a camera connected to the internet pointed at your kid's bed? Um, and you know, it's scary. Yeah, I think it, it, it it really is. Um, and you know, and it's a bunch of these kind of crazy early day stories where, you know, the parent goes into the child's room and there's a voice from the baby monitor just singing. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really the stuff of nightmares. And, and so, so to get back to my original point, which, which was, it's a really interesting time for security um, and to be working for a company or a nonprofit that, that kind of thinks about internet security day in and day out, it's kind of like, well, how do we secure the next generation of internet things? Um, and so this is a problem that kind of really interests me um, and one that I like to stay working on. Very good. Um, well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Going to do this with somebody interesting. I don't think you couldn't, couldn't have found anybody more relevant the Seattle one being especially so um i think it's been yeah no i look forward to whoever's next any recommend any recommendations for the next book you sent me a couple but uh any yeah um so i i i sent you one or two i'll have to think about it but so one of my proudest you know you mentioned having a your, your nose buried in a book um since the summer of 2009 so going on eight not nine years uh i've just kept a list of every book i've read um and so one of the things I had on my to-do list this weekend was just read through that to see if there were any kind of business books. I don't know how many yeah. I was reading at like 13 or 14. I don't think it was many, but, uh, how many, how many of you, can you do in a year? How many books? Uh, anywhere between 60 and a hundred. Yeah. I'm trying to so, do a hundred this year and I've, I've realized I'm going to fail badly. It's actually way <laughs> harder than I think. I think I can do 50 yeah. or 50 or 60, but like a hundred is one every 3.5 days basically. And it's yep. just you get messed up if you've got I don't know if you're like on a holiday or if you don't read for two weeks or something you're like it's impossible, <laughs> it's impossible to get yeah. to yeah well, I, and I kind of realized this early on that that to read a lot it really is just kind of every day or two you have to block out three hours yeah it's, uh, it's not to, exactly to, to it's to not read. that hard to do if you just like if you're like okay I'm gonna do four hours on Saturday you'll read half a book or you'll read nearly a full book but yeah you need yeah. to be so like militant about it Exactly, exactly, exactly. And you know, when Netflix is around or Amazon Prime Video <laughs> yeah, or whatever, yeah. it's it's uh, it, it doesn't just take effort; it takes willpower. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much for everything. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up there. Yeah. You've been, it's been a pleasure chatting to you, Tommy. So, sounds Great. good. Thanks so much.